What's going on everybody? In this episode, we're going to learn how to consume our GraphQL endpoint in our front end application. So the previous two videos have been about GraphQL. The first of those two videos, we created a front end application consuming an already existing public GraphQL endpoint. The second of those videos, we created a GraphQL backend in Django, but you could use whatever backend you want. This video, we're going to connect to that custom GraphQL endpoint. So the start of this is going to be at this URL we defined in index.tsx. We're going to replace this with localhost colon 8000 slash GraphQL. And notice I also switched it to HTTP and I also took off that ending slash, which I'm gonna talk about here in a second. So this is what the URL looks like for my GraphQL endpoint, which we can see at localhost 8000 slash GraphQL and we can pass in our query and get some data back. Now when you take a look at the console on this request, we get a 403 forbidden. And maybe we can take a look at this request here. Cross site request forgery verification failed. Now this has to do with Django's form of authentication for users. We are using post with this GraphQL endpoint which brings up this problem. Now this cross-site request forgery protection provided by Django is not something we're going to need, so I am going to remove it and show you how to fix this error. The only thing is I'm not quite able to put into words why we don't need it, so I will show you this question here. Do I need CSRF token if I'm using bearer JWT, which is the authorization we have been using, and currently our GraphQL endpoint doesn't even require any kind of authorization. And the summary here is that if your application is attaching the credentials via an authorization header, then the browser can't automatically authenticate the requests and cross-site request forgery isn't possible. So feel free to do more research on cross-site request forgery. A quick summary, you can imagine, let's say I visit a malicious website and this malicious website knows of an endpoint that I would normally use on a trusted website and I have that cookie from my authorization. This malicious website can execute that on my behalf and that request could be something very sensitive such as changing my password or transferring funds of some sort. To fix this, Django Forms will have a token that is sent to the client, which is required to be valid when sent back in a post request. So when we visit our site, it's saying, hey, you don't have a valid CSRF token, so we're not going to let you access this endpoint. And the fix for that is just to say, hey, this endpoint is exempt. We're not requiring a CSRF token. Going back to this question, CSRF is an attack vector that specifically attacks requests where the browser automatically provides authentication, typically cookies and basic authentication. And so cross-site request forgery doesn't matter if the browser can't authenticate you. So with that information in mind, we will take a look at our URLs and what we can do is we can say CSRF underscore exempt and pass in the view for this URL. This should fix our problem, but the CSRF is going to need imported, which I have the import statement right here. So from django.views.decorators.csrf, import csrf exempt. Now this should have fixed our problem. So now what we can do is we can take a look at the console and we're no longer getting that error. We're getting a different error, a bad request, which makes sense because we haven't adapted our application to fit this GraphQL endpoints data. So we're making a request to this endpoint, but we are still requesting launches past and this is not what we're going to need for our new and improved GraphQL endpoint. The other thing I wanted to talk about is the forward slash. So if I add a slash here, we get page not found 404. And this is simply that I forgot to put a slash on the end of this path, which is the way we're going to want to use these requests. So now this should work and we can add that slash to our URL here. So the proper way of setting this up is to always leave the slashes on the URL defined in urls.py, and then any non-slash URLs you type in the browser will redirect to the slashed versions, assuming the settings are correct inside of your Django application, which we can confirm. Easiest way is to just test it, and if not, then we will take a look at settings. So starting with urls.py, we will append this slash here, and then check in the browser visiting GraphQL without the slash, and it's automatically added. Perfect, so it's already set up, good to go. If it's not working for some reason, go into your settings.py and confirm in your middleware that you have this django.middleware.com and middleware, and then 
you can set a setting which is append slash which is true, which should be the default, but you can just be explicit there if you want typing that in to make sure that this redirect does in fact work. Now any slashes we type out in urls.py, we will want to have the slash at the end, which makes me wonder about this guy here, since I did not type that out. API slash customers slash 49. And we want to be able to have a slash at the end, so we will go ahead and add a slash. And now this page should work and this page should work. Now we just changed our URL for the backend, but our prior application that was using this path isn't going to need changed because it didn't use that slash at the end, so it should automatically be appended. However, if you just want to be consistent, you can of course go into that application and add the forward slash. So I guess I will just try to make a very serious mental note to always remember to put the slash at the end inside of my URLs to find in the back end. All right, now that we're done with all those distractions, we got this URL set up, which means we should be able to connect. We got the cross site request forgery token ignored. And now all we have to do is head over into app and change what we are looking for with this request. So our actual query should look more like this. So what we could do is we could just copy this and replace this query here with our new and improved query. And now all we have to do is go and modify everything on this page, such as the type, what type the parameter is, what data we're traversing into, and then what's actually being displayed. Before I do all that, what I want to do real quick is just change this from all customers to just a lowercase customers. So that way it's a little bit more consistent with our previous APIs and I'm just going to show you what you actually need to change to make the changes like that. So if you take a look inside a query, we have this field all customers and this is exactly what we're going to want to change. So head over to the backend code and go over to schema.py. Scrolling up, we have the query, which is the root. So if you back up to schema, you have query, and then inside of there you have one field, all customers, which we defined here, and it's automatically converted to camel case. So all we need to do is remove this all here, and then remove the all in the resolve, which will get the data. Saving that, we should now be able to make this request and get the information back. A quick refresh will fix our syntax problems, so now everything looks good. That is purely a display thing, but the actual functionality was still there. Now that we have that, we can go ahead and modify our front end to have customers, ID, name, and industry, and we will change our type that this is expecting. So export type customer, which is going to have a name. And let's go ahead and add an ID in here too. ID is going to be number. And then last thing on here will be the industry. So we will replace this with industry, which will be a string, and we'll get rid of this nested information here. All right, so we have a customer. Let's go ahead and go down to the map. We will want to jump into data.customers, and each one of the customers, singular there, is going to be of type customer, which I'm going to define up here capital C. All right, now we can just say customer dot, and we have those options. So we'll say name plus a space plus customer dot industry. Giving it a quick save, we will just confirm that everything is showing up the way we expect on our front end, and you can see all of our crap data here. But, you know, we have some good stuff here too. So Slack, in communication, Walmart, and shopping, and so forth. Now, if for some reason you're not getting this, go ahead, check the console for any errors. And you can see when I do a refresh, I'm not getting anything major besides it complaining that each one of the maps needs a key property. So we'll just go ahead and add that real quick. The paragraph is going to have a key and it's going to come from customer.id. That should fix that error. And now we are errorless and we can check the network tab to see that request to GraphQL and the data that was returned. So next thing would just be check the network tab and do a refresh to see those requests and see if you get any errors here. We can take those errors and also the loading response and display those on the page if appropriate. So what we'll do here is just say, if there's an error, display 
a paragraph of something went wrong, otherwise null. A very similar thing for the loading. We'll paste this again, but change this to loading and just replace the text with loading dot dot dot. Now let's go ahead and try this out. Do a quick refresh. You'll see loading very quickly. It's all local, so it's going to be pretty fast. And we can also simulate something going wrong either by shutting down our server or just changing the URL. So let's say, you know, we messed up this URL. Well, now it's going to say something went wrong. Let's go ahead and restore that to what it once was. In the next episode, we're gonna do something special. We're gonna talk about how we can pass in arguments to GraphQL, which I showed you briefly in an earlier episode where we are able to get a specific customer by name. And the goal is to talk about mutations as well, which is the ability to add data to our database. Now I know I mentioned nested data, not quite there yet. We're going to continue to focus on data that isn't nested and we'll get to that soon hopefully so stay tuned and i'll see you in the next episode